Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to some more Let's Play The Occult Chronicles. In the last episode, Cindy Rice began her attempt to figure out what ancient book is located within this mansion. And we've bumped into a few hounds while walking around. Looks like they're servants of Anubis. And they are after us to eliminate us, apparently. We have... Managed to scrape together four experience points in the first hour, which is normally would be pretty bad. But we have 19 sanity, which is pretty good for a character who isn't sanity, uh, isn't pentacles or wands based. And since we're not playing this one with any time limit, we can afford to not panic as much about not getting experience so quickly. That's about it so far. We've gotten a few quests, and now we're exploring more of the mansion. Let's keep going. Sure, we'll explore the kitchen. There's usually a quest or two right in this place. You see what at first looks like a blur of light and shadow moving back and forth in a circular pattern. It might even be the reflection of some nearby mirror or window. Suddenly, you see a ghost materialize before you. It's dressed in the classic attire of a chef with an apron and a distinctive cooking hat. You stop dead in your tracks and try and compose yourself. Your mind races contemplating this ghostly creature that has suddenly appeared before you. The fear it elicts is of course natural, but confronting the supernatural is never easy. Especially not with this hand. We don't have anything higher than a five. You feel as if your sanity is slowly slipping away. The ghostly chef floats about in the circle as if moving from working station to working station. It seems completely absorbed in what it is doing and does not seem to be paying you any attention. Let's try and make contact with the ghostly chef to find out what has it so animated. Let's just do it. Hey! I was nervous. My attitude was defeatism because I didn't think we'd flip over a sword, but we did, which gives me an excuse to play the king. And thus we earned a lot of points and a chance for more experience points from the success of this. You enter a trance and make contact with the ghostly chef and inquire about its work. It seems to mutter something and then snaps around to look at you with a fervent intensity. It wants something from you. I've lost my knife. I think it ran off somewhere. Have you found it? It is very sharp and very strong-willed. Has a mind of its own, you know. Please tell it to come here at once. You have a bad feeling about this. Sometimes a knife can be found directly off that room. Oh, we may get the ghostly dinner party right in this room. It seemed impossible at first, but slowly you recognize the sounds of clinking glasses and the soft murmur of conversation. A long dining table stands in front of you, surrounded on all ends by dusty chairs. As you come nearer, you think you detect some movement around the table and the hairs on your arms begin to stand on end. It's suddenly very cold. A ghostly face peers out from behind one of the chairs, and in a heartbeat, you see the apparitions seated all around the table. The scene twists at the threads of your sanity. You struggle to comprehend the brush with the supernatural. You have rarely seen this many ghosts congregated together before. Your mind attempts to find a safe spot at the shock of confronting this other world scene. Before it can find a refuge, the damage is done. You're confronted with a very unusual scene. You stand before a dinner party of ghosts, who for the most part seem completely oblivious to your presence. Occasionally, you see a ghost looking around as if trying to find a servant. However, most of them seem fully preoccupied with ghostly gossip and dinner chatter. We cannot actually talk with them, so we have to just run. The idea of dining with ghosts is hardly appetizing, 
They are not likely to pursue you, pursue you, but you will need some willpower to get your feet moving. You can't think of anything more horrifying than listening to inane ghostly banter, and who knows, maybe your soul was on the menu. Well, no clue token, and without it being timed, we can... I don't mind doubling all the way back around that entire dinner table. Shame we can't communicate with it. We need more pentacles, I think, to make... to do so. I'm gonna be honest, it seems pretty haphazard why some quests require you to have a certain level of pentacles and others do not. I'm not sure why. I was tempted to mod out all the minimum requirements or make them all the same. If you had, like, two of a stat, you could do it. But that was that was gonna be a lot of work, so I decided not to remove the uh, the skill checks in the end. Uh oh, we can't make it to this door without an encounter. You look down and see a large knife resting on a wooden surface. Blood has pooled around it, and there are several stubby pieces of flesh scattered about it as well. Suddenly, you see two pale eyes reflected on the surface of the blade. No, not reflected, but rather projected from some place inside the blade. You recoil in terror from the vision. The eyes seem to pierce through to your very soul. They mask a dark and powerful evil will. You shudder and force yourself to resist it. You can feel it probing your psychic defenses. You've shrugged off the evil spirit's attempt to dominate you. You gaze down at the knife, but try to keep your gaze from locking on to the mesmerizing eyes within the blade. You feel an oppressive presence in the room with you. The knife radiates pure evil. You resolve to approach this artifact with caution, and wonder how many throats this thing has slit. Communicating with something like this is always dangerous. There is no telling how powerful this possessed knife really is. You decide to risk it, and enter a trance. You enter a trance and are immediately assaulted with the desire to harm yourself. Before you know it, the blade is in your hand, but you fight back and make it listen to your command. The knife obeys. It will return to the chef shortly. Well, let's go bring it right back to him. He's right here. The reason why he can't turn this quest in immediately. You enter a trance and tell the chef that you have located his knife. You had to insist a little, but it got the point. The ghostly chef is still moving in an energetic circle, seeming wrapped in its ectoplasmic food preparations. You wonder if it couldn't leave this all behind, or is just being punished for some foul poisoning. An edge upgrade! Mm, I think that's useful. We'll probably put it into Braveheart. Oh, and nothing else. That's a shame. So we can make persuasion and deceptions a little easier, or... Make it so oh, make it so that we never have to use any courage the first feat we use. Let's up Braveheart. That way we can always use sidestep and at least once, which is the only time we can use it in a in a trap challenge, and we won't lose any courage for for doing so. As long as the as long as it is the first feat we use. You think that you hear someone whistling at first. The gloom seems to part, and you encounter a figure engaged in some sort of task. It's dressed in clothes from a previous era. As you come closer, you realize that you are in the presence of something supernatural. The figure is transparent, and seems to glide here and there as if floating on air. No matter how many times you see something like this, it is always a bit of a shock. Your touch with the supernatural threatens to chip away at your sanity, calm your mind, and resist the terror that wishes to overwhelm you. You have kept your sanity. At this point, you've almost gotten used to the spectacle of spirits of household servants scampering around their old haunts. The ghost that you are observing was obviously once a baker. 
you recognize the distinctive clothing and discern that it appears to be going through the motions preparing bread for the oven. You sense, however, that it is agitated. It keeps repeating the same motions over and over as if stuck in some type of circle. It pays you no attention whatsoever. You decide to make contact with the ghost and listen to its story. Many focused hauntings like this have some unresolved business here in this world. Maybe you can help. That's a decent hand. You enter a trance and psychically reach out to the ghost. As you suspected, the ghost is caught in a psychokinetic rut of a sorts. It's not fully aware of this, but it seems eager to talk. I haven't any time for you, shouts the ghostly baker. Unless, of course, you can get my oven working again. It's wandered off somewhere, but I need it cleaned and fast. It's time to make the donuts. The ghostly baker pays you no more heed and goes back to his endless preparations. You need to find this oven and clean it. You see a locked wooden door. There's a worn keyhole right where it belongs, but no sign of a key anywhere. We can try a few pick locks. The bad news about failing these is that you end up with a, a ill omen card, or you have a chance of that. We really can't take too many of those. Our luck, if it decreases too much, that'd be nightmarish. We can try, oh, this hand is not very good. All right, good. This does, however, let us win the challenge. The lock opens. You were just as talented with the lock as you thought. The mechanism clicks, and you turn the knob to open the door. You notice a human figure curled up into a fetal position and struggling for breath. It's obvious that whatever it is, it's sick and probably dying. As you draw closer, you realize that this figure before you isn't human. It's some type of weird half-plant and half-human lab experiment monstrosity. You occasionally encounter things that science shouldn't meddle with, and this is one of those. You stare in horror at the pathetic creature and wonder what madness would drive someone to create this. You were part of the team that broke into the fifth lab and discovered the twisted, alchemically created creatures called chimeras. This isn't anywhere near as bad as that. The dying plant man looks up at you expectantly. You think that you can recognize emotions in its facial expressions, fear and pain. In between labored breaths, it seems to be chittering like it was trying to communicate with you. Its message is plain. Please end this. At first you hear the telltale scratching and scuttling noises. Rats, probably in the walls you think. Without any further warning, a veritable tide of rats floods out towards you. You have heard stories about rats in the walls, but you were unprepared for this. You wonder if they really can take a man down to the bones in a few minutes. Oh, that's a bad hand. That's a very bad hand. And that's probably the only two points we're going to get. <laughs> the rats come towards you like an immovable force of nature. There must be a hundred of them. If they overwhelm you, you fear that you might not be able to get back up. I don't like either of these. We can probably... Well, okay, so I added this as an option. But I think the penalty for losing is still the same. I think it's still going to end up being health loss. Not sanity loss. We'll fight them. Attack the rats. So running is arguably the same as attacking. And they'll chase us all around the house if we fail. And I'd rather not lose any courage if I can help it. So we'll attack. Is there an exterminator in the house? You're outnumbered. But not a gun. We got a knife. We'll just have to carve ourselves up some rat stew today. Rat sandwiches. You kill dozens, wound even more, and fling yet more away. At some point, they seem to break. 
Like they were being controlled by a single will and then scatter and flee. Alright, that was all that was inside the kitchen area. Little dead end area as well. I thought for sure we'd find a way through to some other part of the house in the kitchen. I guess this makes sense. What do we have in here? We had a kitchen, a freezer, a food storage room, the dining room, and a larder. All right next to each other. Hey, that makes perfect sense, actually. And this off this hallway. Oh. If we want to get to the other side of the house without having to go back past the green ooze, we're going to have to run across the plank. This could be the end of us and our run right here. Alternatively, we could go upstairs instead, but the green ooze is right there guarding the staircase. We will make an attempt. I normally do not do this. You see a narrow plank bridging a huge collapsed section of the floor. You test the plank with your foot. It seems sturdy enough. You look down, but can't penetrate the darkness below. You see outlines of rubble and debris from the collapsed floor and judge that it is at least 30 feet down. That's a very long way to fall. Oh wow, we don't have a good way to do this whatsoever! I think the game saw our four swords and decided that, oh yeah, you can handle this. Instead of a six, let's make it a nine difficulty. Speed and decisiveness always win the day. You decide to move quickly and deliberately across the wooden plank. After all, it worked for Julius Caesar at the Rubicon. This is an evade traps. So we'll try our calm sidestep. The good news is we got two points and extra card. The bad news is we rolled very low on that. Still haven't won. You start off with a spring, then another, and you twist to the side in an awkward display of clumsiness. You are, fall you are falling. Uh, as you are falling, you wish you could have a mulligan on this one. Oh, we're dead! Welcome to the basement, everyone. Welcome to the basement. We are in no way ready for this. This could very well be the end of our adventure right here. We need to find the way back up. Probably off of this path. Could find a clue token down here. I hate being down here before I've leveled. We haven't even gotten, we haven't leveled anything besides our initial, uh, what was it, cups? and wands, and that was because of the free five experience points we gained. You step on a pressure plate and hear a loud humming sound echo through the room. It sounds like some type of electronic equipment springing to life. Suddenly, you feel a tremendous force pulling you towards a large near metal wall nearby. Actually, it's not pulling you. Rather, it's pulling anything metal that you have in your possession, and the force is growing exponentially. Acting on pure instinct, you drop and roll away from the trap, hoping that your momentum will take you to safety. The less metal that you have on you, the easier it will be. Well, that was miserable. Again, just the one. You try and get away, but the pull on anything metal that you are carrying is too great. You feel things being torn away. You might have lost some items. We didn't, thankfully. There's a, good, there's a chance you could lose an item, in which case we would have lost our trench knife. Oh no, I don't know how to get back out of this place. You've triggered a trap and the ground beneath you suddenly gives way as a hidden trap door swings open. Using your quick reflexes and athletic ability, you make a tremendous leap to the edge of the pit. You rolled greater than your modified cups attribute. We fail the heroic feat. You are too slow and your hand strikes the edge of the pit. Down you go. 
Avoid the spikes. You are falling down towards a cluster of very pointy and sharp metal spikes. You had better do something fast. Using your quick reflexes and athletic ability, you push off against the wall as you fall so that you land near the edge of the cluster of spikes. You hope that you will miss most of them this way. Not with this hand. This is impossible with this hand. You try and push it against the wall, but you have misjudged the distance and can't generate enough force to move yourself much to the side. You strike the ground with a sickening thud. The pain is so intense that you aren't even sure if you were impaled. Wound. Blind in one eye. Minus one swords. You discovered a secret door. It blends in almost seamlessly with the dungeon wall, but your keen senses were still able to detect it. Finding it is one thing. Figuring out how to open it is another. We cannot successfully climb the wall, so we're not getting back up. We cannot bash the door in either. You examine the door and decide that you might be able to figure out how to activate the mechanism. Wow, we did! You search around the door for anything of note and quickly zero in on some promising locations. After filling around with several bumps and nooks, the mechanism clicks and the door slowly opens. Well, the good news is we're on the basement second floor. Maybe we can find the room because we're dead. This episode, we're either winning the game with through sheer luck like literally the most unbelievable luck in the world, or most more likely, we are dying here. You hear a loud mechanical sound and spin to see that the door behind you has been shut. You try it, but it is locked. All the doors have been locked. Then you hear the grinding noise and the walls start to move in. Welcome to the basement, everyone. This is where, this is why I never head down here early and why I don't play on higher difficulty levels. The difficulty of these would be impossible. As it is, they are they are already impossible for me. Even with the king, I cannot win the I have to get extraordinarily lucky. You decide to search for a switch or button to turn off What what's I guess two tricks and two draws is better than one trick? You're not Hercules, but you're out of ideas, so why not try this? Look for something that you could use to jam the walls in place. You find your arms. And that's about it. You better try harder. The walls are still closing. The walls continue to grind in on you, and you can see that this ends up with you as a pancake. They have closed in a quarter of the way. You better do something soon. <laughs> and we got unlucky. It seems pretty foolish and hopeless since you have nothing but your arms and hands, but you lean into the wall hoping to stop it somehow. You've been squeezed into a small space and it's getting smaller. You've got one last chance. It seems pretty foolish and hopeless since you have nothing but your arms and hands, but you lean into the wall hoping to stop it somehow. The wall's crushing upon you, and darkness takes you. The fear of death follows from fear of life. A man or woman who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. Well, that was the end of Cindy. That's a shame. But I guess I should have expected it. That plank always kills us. This will be the last game, everyone, for Occult Chronicles. What a fitting way to end it. We had a great attempt last time where Doctor Whom won. We had a miserable game this time. We got rather unlucky with all the card draws. And we died horrifically in the basement. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, and this will probably be the last episode of Occult Chronicles. This computer itself will not be in use probably later this year. And as such, this means I cannot record this game any longer unless I pick up some new recording software. And I still like my fraps. So, I hope you guys really liked this playlist. It's been fun to play this game. Oh, uh, but I can't recommend it. The game has lots of balance issues with it. And even modded, there's still many problems with the game, for, even after I've changed it quite a bit. 
I'm not comfortable giving away my mod either because I know there are probably still problems with it. So, uh, I guess I, I don't want to end on such a sour note though. I had a lot of fun. I love the humor of the game. The music is fantastic and it can be very brutal. And when it's brutal, it just never stops kicking your, kicking your teeth in. As we just saw here. What a glorious way to end it. Alright everyone, thanks again for watching and I will see you all in a different game. Take care, everyone.